Hi, Hope family and friends. This is Pastor Harold. We've been in a very fluid time. Uh, due to the coronavirus, things have been swiftly changing around. We get an idea of what's going to be, and then things shift. In the middle of those changing times, it's, it's hard to find your footing. But after a little bit, you begin to develop patterns. You, you may have already developed some rhythms for handling uh, both the time and the changes. Uh, you've got maybe some routines if you have children for getting them in bed now. Uh, or if you have apartment mates, uh, you are figured, you figured out how to work around a new schedule for meals or clean up. We start getting our bearings and we, we feel like we've learned a few things from the Lord, maybe through the pressures. But the time goes on. It's not stopping. And sometimes in the middle of continuing difficulty, we begin to ask the question, uh, I, I picked up a few things. This has been very inconvenient, but we're pretty cheerful about it. So why is it going on? What's the point? That's what I'd like to talk to you about today. I, I don't know all that's in the mind of God for what's happening through this troubled time. But in the Bible, the Lord does tell us some of the things that he does whenever trouble comes and trouble continues. So what I'd like to do today is talk about what's the point in terms of what we do know about what God does. Now, first, you, you need to grasp that Christ followers actually uh, experience many tribulations, not just one or two, but many through time. Sometimes people think that if we come to Jesus Christ, then everything's just going to be wonderful after that. No problems. But Paul, the guy who planted so many churches in, in the first century, apostle of the Lord Jesus, uh, Paul travels through a part of what's now Turkey, uh, through a string of villages, towns, planting churches. Then scripture says after a time, he returned going back through those same towns after he reached his furthest, furthest point, uh, strengthening, the, the, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Uh, it's interesting that he's encouraging them and strengthening them uh, and saying that they're going to have a lot of troubles. Uh, troubles are a part of life. Uh, they, they come to all people. But for those of us who belong to the Lord Jesus, the troubles come with a special purpose for us. And they're a part of living in this world from a very different set of values. They're part of being kingdom citizens. Once we were of this world, now we're of the next world. Once we're of this time frame, now the new age has already started in Christ Jesus. And we're a part of that. Not the new age that so many people talk about today, but the new age is going to fully come whenever he returns. So there, there are troubles that do come. And the Bible uses several words to describe the troubles. I'd like you to take a look at four of them. If you have the handout, uh, you will find a little chart on it that gives you some of the troubles. There are different Greek words in the New Testament used for these troubles. And they, they have different characteristics. They, they all create difficulty. They all create problems. But I'd like to just sort of give you the feel for the different kinds of things. Uh, one, I call the crush. The Greek word is thalipsis. Uh, it's pressure of circumstances, or it could be the pressure of opposition, like people getting mad at you because you're a follower of Christ. But what you feel is pressure. There's just so much pressure on you. And what you begin to feel over time is just burdened, sort of wearied, and you grow sad. Uh, that's the temptation. But that, that's the crush. And then the narrows. There's a Greek word, stenochoria. Uh, it means that things are narrowing down, like going through a narrow passage you know, between rocks. They're, it's getting narrower and narrower. Your choices are narrowing. Your options are disappearing. Your stress is increasing. It's hard to rest in a very tight place. 
um, all you tend to experience whenever the options start disappearing and the stress starts increasing and choices are, are leaving, what you begin to experience is a kind of mental anguish. It, it could be grief, but you, oh, your mind is just stressing over the, it's not so much anxiety as just grief uh, or maybe dread. You know, am, am I going to get stuck in the narrows? Uh, I, I, I hate this. I, I don't know what's ahead. It's, again, it's not so much anxiety as just mental anguish. A third type is hardships. <clears throat> There's a, a Greek word for it. It means that you've been forced into a situation where there are just severely imposed limits um, on your possibilities, uh, limits on your resources. You, you might be in tremendous need, difficult, and you need things, but you've got limited resources. What tends to happen with this one is you, you begin to experience anxiety. If the other one was anguish, this is just, oh no, what are we going to do? How are we going to respond to this? How will we have enough? You begin to worry. Another type is just really hard losses. You you lose things. Uh, this, this word is particularly used for times of persecution. Um, and what people suffer whenever they lose things is pain. Uh, distress, maybe damage, and then that sense of loss. Uh, you might, there, there are people who have lost jobs or been furloughed without, without pay now. You, you lose something, it, 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 it hurts. It just hurts. So you feel the hurts. I, I bring this up because as you're walking through this time, uh, you're going to be feeling a lot of different things. And the Bible talks about these kinds of things. Uh, what you feel, the anguish or the anxiety or the loss or just the sadness. What you feel is what you feel. You need to deal with what you feel and move forward in faith. I'm not saying that what you feel is wrong in the sense of, oh, this is awful sound. It's natural as a result of the consequences. However, if you stay in that, you'll get in trouble. You will be in sin. So you need to deal with it. We pass through a lot of different um, times of difficulty, but God, God uses trouble to grow us and to grow us particularly in two ways. So I'd like to shift our focus to that. Uh, what's the point? Well, one of the big points is to grow me personally and to grow you. Uh, there are things in my life that God's working on right now. And he wants to work on things in your life. He wants, he wants to work on who we are and how we approach things. God uses trouble to grow us into strong, strong character. He, he, he wants to set steel into you and me, uh, the steel of Christ-like character. So God uses tough situations uh, to grow us in character and to set, set his priorities very deeply into who we are. <clears throat> his values are very important to him. The, these are his priorities. And he sets those in us. But he does it through the troubles. James 1, I, I love it in the Living Bible. Uh, James 1 talks about this. James 1, 2 through 4. Dear brothers, is your life full of difficulties and temptations? Then be happy. <laughs> First time I read that, I thought, this, this is crazy. Then be happy. For when the way is rough, your patience has a chance to grow. Patience is not just simply sitting, rocking in a chair, waiting on things to pass. Uh, patience is a very aggressive term in the New Testament. It means an upbeat endurance under pressure, difficulty, even loss. But you're, it's through the difficulty, you're, when the way is rough, your patience has a chance to grow. So let it grow. Don't try to squirm out of your problems, he says. For when your patience is finally in full bloom, you've got plenty of it. Then you'll be ready for anything, strong in character, full and complete. Wow. Difficulty comes. Is your life full of difficulties and temptations? Then be happy. Why? It may not feel happy, but you can be. You can look forward to this because God is going to change you and you're going to like what results from it. James begins with a question Is your life full of difficulties and temptations? 
Uh, the actual word used in the Greek is parasmos. It means putting to the proof, testing, uh, checking something out, finding out if it's real. Uh, and actually the testing could be not just by difficulty, discipline, or um, provocation, you know, being put in circumstances where you just get provoked and you're being tested or difficult. And the question is, are you going to endure? Actually, sometimes this can come through good happening to us. Sometimes God allows good to come into our lives, even in the middle of tests. And what he wants to know is what we're going to do with the good. Uh, in the Old Testament, you'll find characters whom God suddenly provides tremendous opportunity and wonderful things for. And some of them pass the test and others in the middle of the good, they get proud and arrogant and fail the test and it costs them. But it's a testing one way or the other. Right now we're into a lot of difficulties. But good can come in the middle of it and even the good be a test. Is your life full of temptations, difficulties, temptations, testings? Then be happy. Why? <laughs> When the way is rough, your patience has a chance to grow. What happens is, in the middle of difficulty, we have to make choices. We have to choose, are we going to do what we feel, or are we going to do what's right? And maybe we fail once or twice, but fi finally we get it right. We do what's right. The problem is, difficulty goes on. And we have to make the choice all over again. We have to do what's right again and then do what's right again, because difficulty hasn't changed. We're still facing the pressure or the narrows or the limited resources or maybe loss. And we have to choose right again. We have to make the same choices over and over and over. And the Bible says we need to do it with upbeat endurance. That's what patience really is. It's not simply enduring through something or grinding through grumbling. It's actually an upbeat trust in God that makes the right choice. It's hard, but you make the right choice. You know that God will come through. So your upbeat endurance has a chance to grow over and over and over. You endure, you endure, you endure doing right. And out of that comes hardened priorities. You make the choice so many times. Yeah, this is, this is what you're going to do. This is who you become. It's called character. God's priorities are hardened by the repeated choices under difficulty. Now, maybe he's working on a uh, specific character quality, might be speaking kindly in the middle of pressure rather than flashing in anger. And so you get the choice to do this again and again and again, maybe to your spouse or apartment mates or maybe to your kids. Uh, and maybe he's working on you trusting God to take care of dangers that you can't control. And you do this once and you have to do it again and you do it again and you do it again. And what grows in you is that kind of kind of a trust or maybe just to calm yourself down rather than wig out in the middle of the circumstances. So you make the choice and 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 the person you are begins to change. I uh, maybe to actually thank God rather than for his kindness, rather than just taking it for granted. Many times we take God for granted and he really would like us to thank him. He doesn't, he doesn't beat us up because we don't, but we get the opportunity to thank him for his kindnesses by re repeatedly making the difficult choice. Um, you grow, you make the right choice. You call on him sooner. You choose, again to do the right thing and steal sets in you. God also uses trouble to grow us into an upbeat person. Uh, most of us would like to be an upbeat person, you know, someone who lives with confidence in God and they have a positive, bright outlook. For me, uh, that's always been a struggle. Uh, I one, one facet of the personality I grew up with is um, I, I can I can be a little sad. Uh, so for me, it's a challenge, but God works on this. He wants a positive, bright outlook. For many of us, um, <laughs> that 
that has to develop through stress. Some of us just seem to have that, but for many of us, it has to develop through stress. So God takes us through stressful times so that we can become upbeat. Romans 5, 3 through 5 talks about this. Here's what it says. Again, in the Living Bible, I like the way it says it. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. While we know they're good for us. We don't like them. Mm, they feel bad, but they're good for us. Like some medicines. They help us learn to be patient. Again, that upbeat endurance. And patience develops strength of character. Now, Paul is saying what the Apostle James said. Yeah, character comes out of the patience. And helps us to trust God more each time. Ah, huh. yeah. Trust grows as we make the choice. Each time it grows. Each time we use it until finally our hope and faith are strong and steady. Hope is that forward look with an upbeat, upbeat heart, an upbeat, an upbeat mind, an upbeat view of the future. Hope comes out of all this. Faith trusts God in the middle of it. Faith trusts God for the future. Hope looks forward and says, yes, my God is going to be my God. And even if I die, I will be in his presence and it will be good. Uh, for me, I've had to learn that hope, not through the parties, but through the difficult times. And that's the way most of us learn it, really. Hope grows out of the problems and the trials. Uh, the word trials here that Paul uses, troubles and trials, uh, is a word that means pressure. It's the pressures, things crowding in on you, the things bearing down on you, just a heavy weight that you feel walking through the situations. Stuff that just burdens your spirit. It's the stuff that tends toward sadness. It's out of this that the upbeat comes as we trust God and we walk with him. Uh, the patience itself is basically an upbeat, continuing endurance. It just keeps on. How long does it keep on? Well, it ain't over till it's over. So it keeps on until it's over. So there's, there's a sequence here. It's, it's difficulty, repeated trust, 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 difficulty, repeated trust. And then out of that, character, hardened values, the, the things that are on the heart of God are really into our heart. And then out of that, an upbeat look at life in the future. These things come from the Lord as we walk through tough times with him. For you personally, uh, in, the midst, in the midst of this coronavirus time, um, which aspects of this difficult time is he using to stretch you? I mean, what's he really working on in you? Uh, for some of us, uh, it's more anxiety, others it's more anguish. But uh, what, what is he using? Is, is it the pressures? Which one? Which pressure is he really using to work on you through? Uh, tight situations, the narrows. It is, is, it, is it that? The, the disappearing choices, options. If so, which one? Is there one particularly? The reason I'm asking this specific question is so that when that one shows up, you can know what God's doing and, and trust him with it. Uh, maybe it's the limits or the lack of supplies. Uh, so which supplies are really annoying to you? There's been a lot of jokes about the lack of paper towels and toilet paper. Well, it's through the lack that God God does things. Could be could be groceries or loss. What, what losses during this time? Some freedoms, uh, some pleasures and things you enjoyed you can't do now. Uh, which, lot, which ones is God specifically using to shape in you the heart of Christ and an upbeat look at the future? Um, what, may be for, what may he be forming in you by this? Is it deeper trust? Um, maybe creativity with your resources. God's very creative. And he he enjoys creativity. Uh, maybe compassion for other people. Your heart your heart really going out to them, getting outside your own situation and beginning to begin to look at what others are experiencing and pray for them. So 
what is God using and what's he working on? Uh, you will, you'll experience what he's using again and again. And as you cooperate with him, what he's working on will take shape within you. Uh, you don't, you don't so much have to create it as you do respond to him again and again, as we walk through this. Here's another thought. Uh, God, God is not putting us through sort of a uh, laboratory white mice test where we're trying to find our way through a maze and um, he's standing above it all and sort of enjoying our difficulties. That, that's not what God does whenever we're in the middle of testing. The Father does use it to grow us, but his, his attitudes are just different from ours. You and I are at Palm Sunday. It's a very interesting day to talk about this. The scripture says that amid the trouble, Christ runs to help us. I'd like to explain that. On Palm Sunday, many years ago, Christ entered Jerusalem before he was crucified and crowds were praising him and yelling for in favor. And they used palm branches to wave for him and lay down for his donkey to ride over as a symbol of their commitment and loyalty to him. Just five days later, crowds were yelling for his blood, yelling for him to be crucified. So on what we call Good Friday, uh, this next Friday, the Lord was crucified. The crucifixion was the most horrible death the Romans could dream up, most painful way to go, and most tormenting. So he was crucified. He died very hard. And he was buried that evening. And then on Easter Sunday morning, we'll celebrate Easter next week, he came out of the grave alive but with a new kind of body. Uh, but you need to understand, he suffered. He went through testing. He suffered not only physical agony, but unimaginable spiritual agony as the weight of our sins, all the wrong we had done against God, the sins of the world, past, present, and future world, were rolled onto his shoulders, the shoulders of one who was holy and pure. And all the ugliness came on him. Uh, it was an unimaginable suffering for our sins. He died to pay the penalty for all the wrong that I've done, that you've done, that the world had done. And when a person trusts him, that person receives forgiveness of sins. He becomes a child of God and he begins to know God. He suffered incredibly and he experienced the incredibly painful. So he's gone through the testing. You and I are in a kind of testing. He's gone through the testing. The Bible says, so he is able to help us when we are in the crunch. Actually, the way the Greek is written, I uh, in the verse in the Bible, he is highly sensitive to what we're going through. He's not standing back just watching. He feels it. The Weiss translation brings out the, the feeling that's in the verbs in the New Testament. He's a Greek scholar who produced a special expanded translation of the New Testament. And this is the verse, Hebrews 2.18, in the Weiss translation. Catch this. For in that he suffered, having been himself tempted and put to the test, he's gone through this stuff, he is able to run to the cry of those who are being tempted and put to the test and bring them aid. A lot of the translation says he is able to help those. But the way the Greek is written, it's not just help, it's run to help. Why, do, why does he do that? Because he knows deeply the pain. He's gone through the tests. He, he understands. If you're feeling the grinding concerns that come out of this time of uh, difficulty and, and a, a time of testing, then pour your heart out to the Lord. Tell him. Tell him, tell him how you're burdened and weighed down and saddened by what's going on, by the crush and the pressure. Or maybe, maybe it's the anxiety. Tell him about your anxiety over the restrictions that you have on you now. Or tell him your anguish. If it's stuff that's just sort of tormenting your mind, tell him about it. Ask his help. He will run to your cry 
and he will bring bring help to you. He's not dispassionately observing. His heart goes out to you. If you're his kid, he loves you deeply. His heart goes out to humanity, but he has suffered for you and he runs to help. Uh, let me ask you a key question. I think this is a key question for this time. Um, is Christ inside? Is he actually in, in your life? Is he in your heart? If you've never really trusted Christ enough to yield control of your life to him, then I'd like to, I'd like to encourage you to. It's very likely that you're already sensing that he's sort of knocking on the door of your heart like someone knocking on the door of your house. And he wants in. You, you, you sense that in different ways. Uh, he says this in Revelation 3.20, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Invite him in. If you, if you have never yielded your life to him and you seriously want a relationship with God, then invite him in. Tell him. You can pray it, pray this, but tell him, come in, Lord Jesus. I believe you are who you say you are. You are God. Thank you for dying for my sins. Come in to my life. Make me the person you want me to be. If you actually mean it, he will enter your life. He will do what he says he will do. <laughs> uh, you may or may not feel tremendous change immediately, but a new life will begin. Some people feel very strong things. Other people feel almost nothing. But over the next many days, you'll see internally changes taking place because he keeps his word. He will give you a new life. If, if you're making that commitment, let us know about it. We can get you some helpful resources uh, that will enable you to move forward and trust God. Uh, so let me wrap up. We're in a, a time of extended pressure, inconvenience, uh, difficulty, limitations, and maybe some losses. Why does it continue? What's the point? I, I don't know all the points. Uh, God does many things whenever he does something. I don't know all. I pray, I pray for mercy from the Lord. I pray for help for those working and healing for those who are suffering. I don't know all that God's doing, but I do know this much. Uh, he's working on making his people uh, into better people, people like Christ Jesus. He's working on making people realize that they actually need him. A number of people have already come to Christ through this time. And he's working on growing his people into upbeat people who have Christ-like hearts. What's the point? Actually, when all is said and done, the point is at least one of the major points. The point is that you and I will find good in him, that you and I will reflect him more deeply, and that you and I will become people who look to the future with an upbeat hope. I'd like to leave this in prayer. Father, you know what you're doing. Uh, we have a few pieces of information. Thank you for the things that you have said in the Bible about how you use difficulty in our lives. We pray for mercy for people who are sick. We pray for your mercy on the nations that are suffering under this. And we pray for your help, O oh God. We ask you to protect those who are working to help others in the time. And we pray that you would show us in our own lives the things that you're working on and enable us to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen.